Within Star Trek, we have had numerous hero ships, from the iconic USS Enterprise to the tough little ship, the USS Defiant. But our latest hero ship may be one of the most interesting to date. So let's break down everything we know about the new Sagan-class starship, the USS Stargazer. Welcome to Trek Central, lords, ladies, and sovereigns. I'm your host, Lieutenant Adam, and let's get into it. But quick, we're getting super close to 100k total YouTube subscribers, so help us get there! And of course, if you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. And you can also follow us on social media for daily updates on the Star Trek universe. As always, please do let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, specifically which Star Trek starship we should cover next, and please stop asking me for my black hole quantum singularity alcohol mixture that almost destroyed three small colonies near the neutral zone. Okay, engage. The USS Stargazer was a Sagan-class starship active during the early 25th century in service of Starfleet of the United Federation of Planets. The ship was designed and built during the late 24th century, but saw most of its notable service during the 25th. The first ship of its class, uh, probably the USS Sagan itself, would then be followed by the USS Stargazer. The ship was constructed to utilize new components derived from research on the artifact, which is a nice way of saying abandoned Borg cube that was under the jurisdiction of the Borg Reclamation Project, an independent organization which was overseen by the Romulan Free State and had treaties with the UFP for Federation researchers to assist the project as the artifact itself was located in Romulan space. The design of this ship had the usual design elements of Starfleet ships, checking all three of the major boxes in a saucer section attached to a secondary hull with nacelles. However, the secondary hull of the Sagan class, if it can even really be called a secondary hull, was directly attached to the rear of the saucer. The ship also had four nacelles, which wasn't too uncommon a sight on Starfleet ships, and it also placed it in illustrious company with the Prometheus class, the Cardinus class, and the previous Stargazer, the Radiant and Constellation classes. The nacelles had large orange Bussard collectors on them, not unlike the Hestia class that you sometimes see in the Star Trek Online video game, as well as the Gagarin class and other ships of the 25th century seen in that online world. The nacelles were not directly attached to the hull, with their pylons attaching to a structure located above and below the main hull of the ship. This structure seemed to be some sort of engineering bay. Not only did the ship have three separate shuttle bays located at the rear, but also had cargo loading and staging areas on the top of its hull, in front of the cell pylon structure, and behind the bridge section of the saucer. This was known as Bay 4, and was equipped to allow larger pieces of cargo or a variety of shuttles depending on the needs for the missions the Stargazer was deployed on. This bay was connected to the main hangar of the ship through the interior. On either side of the cargo staging area, there were also these weird circular structures. These are actually the warp field governor system, which assists the ship in creating a stable warp field when going to warp. The ship has at least four tractor emitters on its hull, two on either side of the ship, and additionally five transporter emitters visible on its hull, two on the dorsal side of its hull, either side of the bridge module, and three on its ventral side. Talk about ample coverage. This would complement the ship's numerous sensor arrays and strips along its hull. On the underside, you can see the location of the antimatter loading port for the warp core, as well as the exit points for the dual synchronized warp core system, which the Stargazer has. The deflector dish of the ship is sunk into its saucer section and, interestingly, is not overly circular in shape, unlike many deflector designs of the time. In fact, it's not even that oval, either. What purpose this might serve in deflector design, ew. Unknown. But I assume Starfleet was experimenting with variations, considering the previous modern ship seen in Starfleet was the Inquiry class, with its grill-style deflector dish. As can be expected with any Federation ship, it was of course outfitted with weapons. Along the hull are numerous phaser strips which allow for phaser fire in various arcs around the ship. None of the breakdowns though we've seen so far from creatives such as Dave Blass have revealed where the torpedo tubes live but we can be sure they do exist due to them being standard on all Starfleet ships. The question is whether the Stargazer has a complement of quantum torpedoes alongside the regular photon torpedoes, or even some mention of a type of torpedo we might not have seen outside of Beta Cannon, like phased plasma, 
or my own personal design. Uh, no, Captain Jack's giving me very, very strong shut-up signals. Moving on. Unlike the Sovereign class, which suffered from frequent identity crises in regards to its height, the second class was exactly 16 decks tall. The ship obviously had holodecks, and these were located on decks 5, 7, and 9. But whether there's only one per floor, or if there's multiple per floor, eh, nobody knows. You probably guessed that by now. There is a sick bay as well, of course, and that is located on deck 5. The warp cores were located in the engineering substructure of the ship, which from floor plans seemed to be a massive space located on the underside by the pylon section of the vessel. The cargo hold of the ship was located underneath the main hangar, which was also in this engineering substructure. Now, not much of the Stargazer interior has been visible so far, which is why we don't really have that much information to show you. Mostly the corridors, the turbo lifts, and the bridge sections have been the only things we've seen. The corridors are very clean and differ from the carpeted corridors seen on most Federation ships from the 24th century. However, we have seen some corridors coming equipped with weapon racks, similar to what's seen on the Sovereign class starships of the time. The turbo lift of the Sagan class is also very spacious, much more spacious than those seen on other ships. The turbo lift also featured numerous terminal screens around the walls, giving visual readouts of the ship's interiors, probably as well as other functions. These turbo lifts seem to have taken a design inspiration from the ships of the TOS era, which I personally think is amazing. The handlebars lining the walls of the lift are a dead giveaway of this. An interesting addition to the turbo lift is a control panel near the door, which comes equipped with a retinal scanner. Perhaps there are some decks which you need permission to access? Oh, and I just said it was exactly 16 decks tall. Damn. Anyway, the bridge of the Sagan class is very sleek, with the usual iconic central command chair setup found on most Federation starships. There are two individual four control consoles for helm and navigational, what was the difference between those two again? I forget. Anyway, the interesting thing about these four control consoles is that on the floor of them, they have holographic assisted foot controls. Perhaps this can be altered to have it work like the pedals of an automobile or perform other functions. Maybe this is how they manage the self-destruct. No, I've made that joke before. Never mind. The terminals surrounding the bridge are incredibly large curving up the side of the wall and show a variety of different displays from dilithium articulation frame status to communication system status. And as usual, you have a captain and up to two commanders seated in the center of the bridge, though there are ramps either side of this section and it's slightly elevated with steps to the front. This seems like a trip hazard to me, but oh well, as long as they still have seat belts. After all, it took forever to get those installed as standard. The most combustible consoles on this bridge seem to be the ones at the back of the bridge, ironically, mostly the engineering ones, near the turbo lifts, in fact. They have a transparent display above their consoles, which is given to just going boom at random, it would seem. The same design of consoles can also be seen at the front, either side of the seated consoles. It's almost like they designed them for maximum dramatic effect. How strange. Just behind these consoles are where the primary ODN manifolds are located, and this system uses an upgraded bioneural gel pack technology, presumably derived from research on the bioneural gel packs used on the USS Voyager in the Intrepid class, so hopefully they can no longer get ill from Neelix's cheese. I don't know, I feel like that's on the same level as the Borg as far as galactic threat goes, especially if the only cure is to just gulp down a hundred tons of Leola root stew. Blech. But this bioneural gel tech has been incorporated into a more dynamic isolinear chip. This allows for a more reliable storage, faster speed, more intuitive processing, yada yada yada, upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. This more advanced isolinear chip can be seen here, with the gel in the center of the chip, though there also seem to be an energy-based isolinear chip system as well. The most interesting part of the ODN manifolds, of course, was the incorporation of the Daystrom M47 Quadratronic Multiprocessing Unit, Eh, say that 17 times fast. But obviously working much better than the M5 Multitronic Processing Unit last seen in the original series episode, The Ultimate Computer. Anybody remember that gem? It was like the berserk offspring of HAL 9000 and the Power Rangers Alpha 5. The view screen of the bridge was actually created using holographic reconstruction generators that create a 3D view of space, data, and information and project it on the viewer. A blast shield can cover the opening, which can become a transparent window as needed. So it's both a window and a view screen. Mind blown. An interesting thing about the bridge is that the viewing lounge was directly accessible from the rear of it, through a centrally located door. It seems like this door has frosted window tech for privacy. How very Apple of them. 
The viewing lounge offers a view of the cargo loading bays, as well as the engineering bay, which connects to the nacelle pylons of the ship. However, inside we see a table for meetings, which has a console integrated into its top, allowing for more detailed meetings without pointing to a view screen off the side. The viewing lounge also has shelf space for random knickknacks, which in this case are ship models of the previous ships called Stargazer, a plaque of the previous constellation USS Stargazer, and other random sculptures. The captain's ready room is located just off this viewing lounge, though this room has not been seen yet. Perhaps this set is being saved for another project, who knows? But we can imagine the Sagan class has a modern-ish looking ready room, likely complementing the similar designs we see for the conference room and bridge. Although it is weird that it isn't just directly connected to the bridge. I mean, that's what the ready room is for. But anyway, the Stargazers seem to have a complement of the new Type 14 long-range shuttlecraft, with one of these shuttles named the USS Jamieson after the NASA astronaut May Jamieson. These shuttlecraft look particularly armoured compared to their predecessors. The Stargazer is also not the first ship to be named Stargazer, of course, and even though it has its name from the Constellation class USS Stargazer, NCC-2893, which was famous for being under the command of Captain Picard in the 2330s, there was actually a relatively unknown Stargazer before that, the Radiant-class Stargazer, which was a Starfleet vessel during the time of Kirk and his captaincy of the Enterprise NCC-1701, insert Scotty quote here. And yes, I'm fully aware that I've told that joke before as well, now leave me alone. During the year 2401, the Stargazer was under the command of Captain Cristobal Rios. The Stargazer was tasked with investigating a spatial anomaly in 2401, which had formed and damaged the Akira-class starship, the USS Avalon. The crew of the Stargazer under Captain Rios included Commander Moshi, a Trill who served as First Officer, Lieutenant Singh, a Bajoran who served as Communications Officer, the Human Operations Officer, Lieutenant Urton, and a Halean helmsman called Ensign Kimi, all of the pronunciations of which I have probably just mangled. Sorry. The Stargazer would receive a message from this spatial anomaly, and with the assistance of cyberneticist Agnes Jurati, would decode this message as not only requesting Admiral Jean-Luc Picard, but also included the entirety of Article 15, a legal document used by a non-Federation member to make a request to join the United Federation of Planets. This request was, bizarrely, made by the Borg, who would appear through the spatial anomaly and would then transport their queen aboard the ship for negotiations. Captain Rios was unwilling to allow a Borg queen to beam aboard the Stargazer, but the Borg, of course, never take no for an answer and straight up beamed her onto the bridge anyway, because of course they did. The queen would then say she required power and began to assimilate the ship, which was assisted by the fact that the ship had components derived from Borg technology. Whoops. She would go on to use the ship as a hub to obtain command codes for the entire Starfleet fleet that was assisting the Stargazer against the Borg threat. Whoopsie daisy. While Stargazer officers attempted to take out the Queen and failed miserably, other plans went into action. Admiral Picard, who was currently on board the Stargazer, attempted to activate the Stargazer's self-destruct system before the Queen could fully assimilate the entire fleet, because that worked so well that one time with Data. Unlike the one time with Data though, this time Picard was thwarted by Q and some temporal hijinks on his naughty behalf. Picard, Seven, and Raffi would return to the Stargazer without Captain Rios or Dr. Girati. Seven will be given a field commission by Admiral Picard and take command of the Stargazer and open negotiations with the Borg Queen, who, as it just so happened, was Agnes. From the past. There were two of them now. Yay, quantum mechanics! Allowing her to take command of the fleet, the combined ships would be able to harmonize their shields to prevent an energy wave from the formation of a transwarp gateway from damaging the nearby sector, which would possibly destroy several inhabited planets and kill billions of people. That's right, the Borg let their powers combine and basically captain planeted themselves into hero status all of a sudden. It makes no sense to me either, but I can't lie, it was brilliant. The second class starship was designed by John Eaves, Doug Drexler, and Dave Blass. Obviously, John Eaves and Doug Drexler are renowned Star Trek designers, with John Eaves responsible for numerous famous designs from DS9 to Discovery, and Drexler being well known for his work from the next generation onwards, but also for the creation of the NX-01 Enterprise. However, the Sagan class really is a collaborative effort from so many different artists, so let's give those we know a shout out at what they worked on to get this ship made. 
Let's first go over many of the concept artists that worked on the Stargazer. And again, apologies to any terrible pronunciation. We have Igor Nezovic, Matthew Cunningham, Sean Hargraves, James Chung, and Darren Docterman. And I am sure there are many more. However, this does not just include concept artists, but set designers, graphic designers, and everyone else involved with bringing such a thing to life on our screens. The dedication plaque was designed by Jeffrey Mandel, who is a famous graphic designer and has done a lot of previous work on Star Trek. Mandel would also do the graphic work for many of the capsule stickers seen throughout the entire ship. The gold Starship models made for the Ready Room were made by Starship designer Bill Krauss, who also would then design the Radiant-class USS Stargazer, and the primary ODN manifold FTL nanoprocessing unit from the bridge of the Stargazer was designed by Darko Darmar Markovic. Many concepts for the bridge and its consoles were done by concept artist James Chung, James being the one who came up with the idea of holographic-assisted foot controls on the floor of the consoles. A fun little easter egg is that many of his designs had Nova-class or Vengeance-class starships from Into Darkness, as placeholder textures on the console screens. James Chung seemed to be also the one who came up with the new isolinear chips, which incorporated bioneural gel. And funnily enough, the file of these is titled Isolinear Chip Tide Pods. So let's hope no cadets try eating those in the 25th century, please. Ugh. I'm sure there are many stories about the creation of the Stargazer, from its exterior to its interior, with Star Trek Picard Season 3 having been filmed back to back with Season 2, and the number of Starfleet ship interior leaked pictures we've gotten from series showrunner Terry Matalas, we definitely may see more from this ship. And with Season 3 seeing the return of many of the main TNG cast, I wonder what adventures they and the crew of the Stargazer may get up to in Season 3. If the ship does indeed appear, that is. But what do you think of the Stargazer? Let us know in the comments below, because as always, if you're talking about Star Trek, then we would love to hear about it. And if you want to keep up to date with all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then make sure you hit that subscribe button. Never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media or join our community Discord server. But for now, I've been Lieutenant Adam. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends.